Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on the show, I'm pleased to introduce you to Sharon Cormier. Sharon is a yoga teacher, meditation instructor, and inspirational speaker. She believes that having a near-death experience is mostly about how to live here, right now, in this moment. Her study of Eastern philosophy has increased her understanding that an NDE helps us to awaken, to experience the truth of life, rather than live in fear of death. Using this experience, Sharon teaches her students the wisdom of living as a wise person would, as well as letting go of fear, especially the fear of death. Her books, Where the Lotus Blooms, Finding Inner Peace Through Med- through Mindfulness, Yoga and Meditation, and AFKI's A Guide to Self-Awareness and Change, co-written with Barbara Harris Whitfield, are about bringing enlightenment to all of us, that it is our birthright as a human being to have an open and peaceful heart and mind. Welcome to We Don't Die Radio, Sharon Cormier. Thank you so much, Sandra. I'm very, very happy to be here. It's just a wonderful opportunity, and I love to share. I love to share my story. I love to help people let go of the fear of death, um, and I think that. What you said in the very beginning is that the near-death experience, for me at least, was to help me learn that death, there's no, no need to fear death, but there is a need to live this life fully and with a lot of love and compassion. Yeah, so you're right in the right place for this time because that's what I love to share and I think our listeners are looking for as well. So Sharon, where are you? You're in Connecticut? I'm in Connecticut, and I have lived in Connecticut all my life. I've, I've traveled some. I've traveled to the Middle East, and I've mm-hmm. been to um, Jerusalem, which was probably one of the most impactful places I ever traveled to because it's such, it has such rich history and is steeped in mysticism. Yeah. And a near-death experience makes you very open to that. I um, love that. When I was... Uh, a young girl. My mother died when I was young. She was, I was 16 and she mm-hmm. died quickly and of cancer. In those days, if you got a diagnosis of cancer, that was pretty much it. Right. And um, also in those days, they didn't believe in telling the person who was dying that they were dying. Really? Oh, yeah. And so the burden on the family to pretend everything is okay is horrendous. And when my mother died, they just took her away in an ambulance by herself. And it broke my heart. Of course. To know that there was no one with her. And it was something that I carried around quietly. Because sure. Who do you talk to about that? And when I was 21, I had um, an emergency appendectomy. And the operation went fine, Mm -hmm. but for some reason, the day after, my body just started to shut down, and I went into shock. And I found myself looking down at myself. It, It just happened so suddenly that I lost consciousness, and then I was up in the corner of the hospital room looking down at this little doll, who was me, Mm -hmm. in the bed. And the first message, I would have said before that it was a thought, but it's actually a message, was, this is what it is to die, and it is not what you've been told. Because I felt wonderful. And when I acknowledged that message, and I had been looking at this little body in this little bed, and I looked up, I was out in what I have found the only word I can use is the universe, Mm -hmm. and I was there, and only it wasn't unfamiliar. I, it was very familiar to me. I had been there. I maybe came from there, and there was a um, total sense of complete contentment, and yet of total awareness, and at that moment, that's when I felt my mother. Now, I didn't see her. 
but I felt her actual love. It felt like silk. You know how a piece of silk floats if yes. you just drop it? That's what it felt like wrapped around me. In that moment, that pain of the separation from her with no goodbye was gone. Wow. And I didn't, you know, it was, it was amazing because I didn't talk to her. She didn't talk to me. It was as if there was no separation between us. And then that was done. It was just that pain was just done. And I moved, moved, I don't know how, but you just kind of moved forward. And there were all of these questions that we all have. Why am I here? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Why do bad things happen to good people? They were all answered. Again, not in language, but just so that I thought to myself, Oh, oh, right. I, th I think I knew that. But unfortunately, we don't get to take it back with us. Um, but in that place, in that warm, bright softness, I was totally at peace. And there was no um, angst within me, just total acceptance. And I felt myself moving again. And at this point, since then, I have thought about that moment many, many thousands of times, that it, had I traveled further, there, that's when you don't come back. But I, there was the coming back, and it's instant, and it happens, and you have no choice. Hmm. And when I came back into my body, the doctor was doing CPR on me, and um, they, it was quite, there was noise and confusion and I couldn't talk or move, and I'm looking at him, and I could feel the tears coming. And he patted me. He's like, you're all right. You're, go you're going to live. But what he didn't understand was the tears were was because I wasn't there anymore, that I was back. And as soon as oh. I... Oh. Yeah, I didn't want... I just got that. Okay. I wanted to stay there. Sure. But at that moment, again, the message message was... It's going to be okay. And I relaxed into it. And then the healing, you know, the process. But this happened at a time when nobody, there wasn't the word near-death experience. Hmm. When my doctor came in the next morning, I said to him, did they tell you what happened? Did they tell you that I died, but I, I, I came back? And he looked at me, he said, that didn't happen. Oh. And... I was young, right? Twenties, mm -hmm. and I said, "Okay, I better not talk about this." And it was some years later when um, Raymond Moody Moody wrote his book *Life After Life*. Yes, that I said, "Ah, oh, that's what happened to me." But in the meantime, as this young woman that I come back into this world, it had been totally altered. My upbringing had been um, Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. very strict. We have priests in the family, all of that. Um, and I knew that so much of what they told me was not true. There was no hell. There was no um, horrible thing that happened to you when you died. I don't know where you, I knew then, and I still know now, I don't know where you go exactly. Mm -hmm. I can't you that answer but I do know that we we move on into you know if you read enough of the new discoveries they make in science and quantum yep. we don't know we have no idea we're just babies beginning to learn about all of the mysteries around us not that long ago everybody thought the world was flat right you know True. that yes you write about that uh-huh the sun revolved around the earth. Well, I don't know. Maybe string theory. Maybe there's another universe that's just like this one where we, we move to. And maybe they can watch us. Maybe that's where angels are. I don't know. I do know, for me, at, that the path that I went on from there was a spiritual path. And I think most people who have an NDE end up walking on one, yeah. whether or not they know it. 
mine led me to um, wanting to find how to live here now as wisely, as lovingly as I could. That's a good path to be on. <laughs> well, it's not... In our culture, it seems that we have forgotten how to um, appreciate what we do have. Mm -hmm. We tend to keep grasping at more and more. I mean, a perfect example is a new iPhone comes out. <laughs> I can relate. I know. I mean, I need it, right? No, I have to have it right away. Yes, yeah, right, right away. I can't wait because the world will end. But my... Um, my readings, and I studied a lot of spirituality after that because I knew that what had happened to me was profound, but I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. So I studied and I read. And through all of that became, found that the ancient histories, the ancient sages, they knew it because they weren't, um, they weren't so busy, and they weren't distracted by all the things that we get distracted by. They actually were allowed to have the job of trying to figure out God, the universe, the meaning of life. That was a pretty respected profession Sure. 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. You're talking it, long, long ago. Well, they knew it long, long ago. Yeah, wow. They may have called it something different, right? but they talk about the all, the all. So you really about, have been studying? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> if you're going back that far, you, right, you're right. on a well, mission. Because for me, it was the understanding. It was a way to find, um, I wanted to find peace. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what was the most important thing to me was to find this inner peace that I knew was available, but I was going to have to do it. Nobody could hand it to me. Yes. And uh, through that, I had to learn how to deal or understand such things, the things that go wrong in our life. When we are anxious or unhappy, mm -hmm. when we lose someone we love. Yes. Either through death or through the end of a relationship, what are we supposed to do with with that pain? Um, and why? Why doesn't happiness last? Where does it go? And that was part of. I knew that letting that I had to keep looking for it. And for me, um, the philosophy of yoga and Buddhism talks about that all the time it talks about living in the here and the now and all I wanted to do was to be there in my NDE experience here and those two words are contained in the one word there and here are in that one word oh and they certainly are so I wanted and felt that that's how we were supposed to live. Can I ask you, just because you brought up these questions, like where does happiness go? What happens with the pain? I know we, you know, I've lost relationships and by death or however. And, and what, from what you've learned, what, what hope can you give us? I mean, what, I don't even know really what the question is I'm asking. Um, but those questions that you had yourself, what do right. you do with that pain? I mean, can you move on? Is that peace that you felt in your NDE something that we can get to here? Uh, yes, yes, it, it, it is. And it takes, it takes being, it, it takes acceptance. And what we do as normal humans when we hurt when we are in pain, we resist it, we push it away, and we say, no, mm -hmm. this is not what I wanted. I wanted something else. I want something, I want it to be the way I want it to be, even in the face of it can't be that way. 
So what I learned was the thing that I can count on in life is that it's going to change. And that if I'm deeply unhappy today, if I look at it and say, if when, what, losing my mother. Right. Extremely painful. Yeah. Um, and I loved her. And I had to live with that for a while, yes, with the pain. But then I knew that after my near-death experience, that she wasn't in pain. She had she she was fine, so that lifted some of it off of my heart. Um, also, when you lose someone in a relationship, it's friendships you can lose a friend, and it can be very painful. Sure, that you have to accept that that's the way it's supposed to be, and allow change in, allow the healing of time. I explain this to my beautiful granddaughter who I love very much who, who has had some, some difficult times and, and she understands now that the only thing you can do with some of this is to just stand still and let it be and you will move through it but it's hard work it is you just said <laughs> except that's the way it's supposed to be what if I don't want it to be that way that's the problem we resist, and the resistance only makes us hurt more. The more you fight something, the more it hurts. When you sit and you accept that this is the reality, and this is the way it is, and that I will, again, one day be happy, then it happens, because you open up to that possibility. When we won't open to the possibility because we demand that it stays the way we want it to stay, um, then we're just going to keep hurting. I could have done that in my near-death experience had I, when I came back, I, as I said, I didn't want to be there. And I could have spent the rest of the last decades being angry that I'm not there. Now, what would, I would never have learned all the beauty of the things that I have. Of Mary Oliver states it in her one of her poems that what will you do with your one wild and precious life? Hmm. You know, I mean this is our wild and precious life. We will get we will have pain. It will come and it it will go. That's a fact. Can you remember when you were ten or thirteen when the most horrible thing in the world ever happened to you? What happened to that? The pain goes away because we move on. I really love how you say I can count on it is going to change. That's oh, it is. very powerful. It, well, it is. And if we, if we have faith in that, if we have faith that, that it will change, and, and you know it will because you've seen it happen in your own life, it's not easy. And um, I think part of our... Our, our cultural uh, bias right now is to have a quick fix. You mean, you mean I can't get the cable company out here in the next hour to fix my TV? That's unacceptable. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way we are. We sure are. Well, we yeah. have these voices in our head, don't oh. we? Michael Singer calls it the roommate. Oh, <laughs> and it's a messy roommate. <laughs> oh. And they never, ever stop talking. And that's one of the things that I, um, that became so helpful to me in my past that, was, that I took away from my experience was that I had to live here and I had to live now mm -hmm. was I learned what is called the four excellent qualities. I love the way Buddhism and, and yoga say things like that. I think that's grand. Before Four excellent qualities? Excellent qualities. Okay. Which are loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. What's that word mean? Well, that means the spacious stillness of mind okay. that will give you the ground 
to have the other three things. It's harmony. Harmony within. It's a radiant calm within us. And when I read this part about loving kindness, loving friendliness, and I thought, wow, I I like the sound of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And in, in one book I read, it was described as a gentle rain that falls indiscriminately upon everything in your life. I thought, wow. So if I give loving kindness outward to people in my life and all of that, then of course it is. But then I realized I had to give it to myself first. You know, because that voice, you know, the roommate in there yeah, yeah. telling me that I'm not worthy of that, that I've done everything wrong, and that I will probably continue to. But if I stopped it and said, no, 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 that's not true. I'm really a pretty nice person. I did this for somebody the other day. That loving kindness that I know most of us have no problem giving to other people, but we have a really big problem giving it to ourselves. Uh, Big time. Yeah. I can (laughs) acknowledge that, yep. And compassion. When was the last time you gave yourself compassion? You know, we don't. We beat ourselves up. We mm-hmm. say, well, you were, you know, if you hadn't done whatever it was, whatever horrible thing that you probably didn't really do, but for me, it could be like, you know, you ate too much, or you didn't exercise today, or, you know, I mean, the list is really endless. If my friend said to me, well, you know, I my back hurt today, and I didn't exercise, and I would say, well, that's a smart thing. Your back hurt. You shouldn't exercise. Right. I can give them compassion. But can I hand it to myself? Well, that's what loving kindness is about. And the feeling the feeling of joy, just plain, simple joy. We often don't allow ourselves that, and we don't often acknowledge it for other people. So I started to practice the four excellent qualities. Mm-hmm. Well, actually the three, because the fourth one comes about when you practice the three. Okay. But it's hard. It's hard. Because we are trained to look at the negative. Yes. And that's biological. I I studied that. Why? Why am I always so willing to see the bad? Because biologically, you know, that's what kept us alive on the savannah. We had to look around. We didn't have to look and see if the sun was shining. We had to look and see if the long grass was moving because there was a tiger coming towards us. I'm so glad you said this because I'm somebody who just thought it was me. That I mean, I have accomplished a lot and done a lot, but I'm always looking at what's undone, mm-hmm. what's not right, and looking at the bad. Right. So it's not my fault is what you're saying. It's biological. It's not. We okay. are hardwired that way. Good. And believe me, when you when you that aha moment hit me, I went, Well, for heaven's sakes. I can I now. And all of this 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 study, this recognition that I have it in my control to have that life and that calm that I want, I have the ability to do that. Nobody else can give it to me, only me. And um, it was and is ongoing. And I teach, when I teach yoga to my students, believe me, you will never come into a yoga class with me and have to stand on your head. You will never come into a yoga class with me and have to twist your body into something terrible. That's what not, that is not what yoga is about. What is it about? It is about, actually, there's eight limbs to yoga. They call it eight steps or eight limbs. And the third one is the postures. And they came up with the postures because they realized that nobody could really sit and have self-contemplation or look out and appreciate nature or other people if their body hurts. So they had a few poses, ones that were very comfortable, ones that helped rotate your spine so it's unkinked, ones that made your hips a little bit looser. Now you're hearing nice words, right? Yes. You're hearing ease in the body words. 
And when the body's comfortable, then you can sit and you can meditate. And meditation is all about just letting go of that voice in the head, of challenging it and saying, shh, be quiet. And that's what yoga is about. That's so funny because I've always just equated the body, the postures. Yeah. Thinking, oh, geez, you twist yourself like a pretzel. Who wants to do that? <laughs> really? Well, yeah. that, that isn't what it's about. And, and I think that's where my, um, it's all about loving kindness to your own physical body, compassion to what you can physically do and what you cannot do. And having wonderful sense of joy when you can do something. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, all of a sudden your life feels a lot more in balance. When you're in balance inside, when the things change and the hurt or the pain or the difficulty or anxiety or even depression comes in, the balance will say, okay, I need to give myself some compassion here. How do, how do we do that, though, Sharon? I mean, if you're in the midst of a sad time or someone just hurt you, it's it's so easy for the roommate to just grab a hold and take the reins and be like, we're going to stew upon this, we're going to make them wrong. How do, how do we actually put in compassion? It sounds great. Oh, just be joyful. But how? how? Well, you know, if you really think about it, our own thoughts are what create our world. Nothing else creates it but what we're thinking. So putting aside grief, which is, can be a different thing, let's say anxiety yep. or fear, um, fear. Yep. we create it with our thoughts. If you're having anxiety, you start to go in a loop of thoughts. Okay, this is going to make me really nervous. I'm not going to be able to talk well on this interview today. I'm probably going to sound like an idiot. Yes. Yeah, what if? What if this happens? What if this happens? Right. Yeah. So there's my thought. So the the Buddha says, and all of the yoga and self help books of every kind will say, change the thought. Now that's hard. But when you have the thought, oh, I'll never be any good at this, then you say, well, wait a minute. You can get up in front of a room full of 50 people and you can talk. What makes you think you won't be good at it? It's a constant change of the way you think and replacing it so that that calmness can be inside you. It's difficult, hard work, but it's so worth it. And you're going to be thinking anyway. Of course. You know, I don't know how to... That's the one thing I haven't figured out. You can't really turn it off. By the way, when you meditate, you don't stop think thoughts. Um, what you learn to do and what I wanted and what my path took me from, to was to find a way to tell that voice, you're wrong. Or you can say that, but I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to the other voice. What other voice? The one that said, called our, we all have, we are inner, we are good. We are basically goodness as people. Mm -hmm. We are, and we, we won't go in there and, and pull it out and say, yeah, look at that. That's really good. You'll find it in your friend, won't you? Your friend that comes to you and says, oh, I'm such an idiot. Do you know what I did today? And you will sit them down and you will say, yeah. Well, I remember watching you do this so spectacularly. How can you think that you can't do that? How many people in your life, Sandra, have you built up that way? Have you told them how wonderful they are? Oh, quite a few. I've, I've actually seen people transform from being negative and grouchy to feeling great about themselves. I mean, and it's it, it can be as easy as asking a couple questions like, what do you love to do? And tell me about when your first child was born or how did you meet your wife? And mm -hmm. man, it can transform somebody. So if we are all goodness, you brought up a question that you had in your uh, near-death experiences. Why do bad things happen to good people? Do you know the answer to that? Well, I think what I have found in my own searching and we all have to find our own truth. But bad things 
happen all the time. And, and first of all, some of that is we have to think about what is the bad thing. And some of it is just merely change, just because things are going to change. Now, a car accident, that's what's the word, accident. And it's a bad thing. And, mm -hmm. it, can, and it can hurt people and people can die in them. Right. Uh, there isn't a cause other than somebody wasn't paying attention. So it's not, it's not evil versus good. Those are accidents. And bad things happen to good people. I mean, I know bad things have happened to you and you're a good person. Um, it, yeah. You didn't deserve them. No. But usually, for me, I find something in there that changes me and usually will make me stronger or give me a better idea of what not to do the next time. Right. You know, um, I had a bad thing happen to me 10 years ago when I was taking riding lessons. The horse went nuts mm -hmm. and threw me. And I broke many bones in my back and my pelvis. And I'm, I was really pretty smashed up. I could have sued stable. I could have walked around for a limp and been miserable and told everybody how awful I felt for the rest of my life. I could have. But I had to take responsibility that I got in the back of the horse. I know horses throw people. I know people get hurt. Look at Steve Reed. Yes. Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't work out well for him either. Um, so that was my attitude. And my acceptance of my responsibility in whatever happened, because we usually have some, and move on and find what I could out of it. And I had to, you know, for four months, I couldn't move but very much. And, you know, the doctor told me that they all tell you terrible things. And I said, you know what? I don't believe him. He told me I would never be able to bend over again or touch my toes or do anything like that. And I didn't believe him. And I can do all of that and still do yoga. Right. I want to talk a little bit about your books. Which came first, Where the Lotus Blooms or Afghis? Uh, Where the Lotus Blooms. I had been working at a, I had been teaching at a retreat for people in recovery. And they were going to be, you know, doing a lot of inner work, which was going to be very difficult. Um, so I was there to open them up to breath work and some gentle yoga and some meditation. And I would say of the 100 people there, 99 said, oh, I, can't, I certainly can't do yoga, and I don't know what you need about breath work. And at the end of it, every single one of them were like, I had no idea I would be able to do that. And meditation helped me so much because I took people that were in a lot of distress emotionally. Mm -hmm. We were in uh, South Carolina on a beach and we did walking meditation. And they all said to me, I never really noticed the beach before because they hadn't walked in awareness. They stayed too much in their head until I put them in their body and said, just put one foot in front of the other and listen. Hear the birds. Feel the mist on your face. Feel the sand under your feet. It's, I don't want to interrupt you. We'll wait till you finish your thought, and then I want to tell you about it, something that just happened to me because it ties right in with this. Oh, tell me, please. Um, I went for a walk a couple days ago. In mm -hmm. fact, your co-author, Barbara Harris Whitfield, was my guest two shows ago. And it was just really powerful. After I talked to her, I went out for a walk, and I was really trying to be mindful, really be in the present moment, and just breathe and just pay attention to nature. And I feel so silly saying this, but like I saw leaves for the very first time. Now, I'm 49 years old. There's been leaves everywhere. Right. But I was looking, I was actually taking pictures of like, look at these leaves. And now uh, it's November that we're having this conversation. And so some of the leaves are still colorful. But like a little kid finding something new. I mean, they're leaves, Sandra. But I mean, it was just like 
the most miraculous things. It's just something shifted that I saw something that's always been in front of me, but I saw it differently. And that was really cool. Well, it's because we have, we, nature is, we are, we are part of nature. We aren't separate from it. We act like we are, mm-hmm. but we're just like, you know, like the coyotes that are in my backyard. They're mammals. I'm a mammal. We're the same. I just have a better living condition than he does, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure. But that's the, out of all of our busy little lives that are so filled with, you know, oh, I want this and I, I have to have that and this person was mean. But if we step out and we look at this beautiful planet that we live on mm-hmm. and we have gratitude. If we look out and we say, Meister Eckhart, who is a mystic in the 1300s, wonderful, beautiful, spiritual person, that is the only prayer you ever say, make it thank you. Wow. Two words. Thank you. And you don't, you know, I mean, think about it. Thank you. I'm, I'm here. I'm grieving. I have all possibility open in front of me and it's my choice what I go for and I want to live here in this moment in this life the best I can Mm -hmm. I need to be aware I need to be mindful I need to be kind compassionate to myself and to others and you know then it just I think it, it unfolds it becomes that way it's, I know for me, and this oh. has been painful to do, but when I'm really stuck that like I'm right, somebody else is wrong, or if I'm miserable, yeah. or if I yeah. feel like a victim, sometimes I force myself on a piece of paper to write 20 things I'm grateful for, and like I really don't want to do it, Sharon, but I, I force myself to, but it actually slows me down, it gets me present, yeah. I start feeling those feelings of being grateful for them and the next thing you know that i can look at that situation differently thank you is a is really a profound thing to do and that is that is really that's such a beautiful thing that you do i mean think about it that again it's that voice we lose sight of the good and we we keep going to that negative because we are hardwired for it but we can build new neural pathways in our own brain to find peace and pleasure out of everything that comes at us. And yes, things will hurt. And when we get hurt, that's when we have to be kind to ourselves. That's when we give compassion. That's when we're hurt, somebody has hurt us, then yes, you sit down and you write, okay, but I have these things to be grateful for. And what I really came away and have worked with all these years because when you have a near-death experience that never leaves you, think about it all the time. And I've always thought about, well, this has been my path, different than many others have taken. Right. I understand that um, because I have to find mine just like you have to find yours. Look what you've done. It's wonderful. You've written that fabulous book. But you would never have thought that was where you were going to go. No, because it came out of the worst thing that happened when my dad died. Exactly. So there, when the worst thing, when the bad thing happened to a good person, look what came out of it. Right. And for me, um, when my mother died and my my entire family just fell apart, um, I had to find something to ground myself and that's when I realized in the NDE that that's what that was. That was my message. Don't be afraid of dying because, you know, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, we don't really die. I know that if we don't, we, we move out of this um, manifestation of it. Mm-hmm. The body does. It wears out. Trees, they live for 100 years and then a tree will die leaves falling off the tree right they're they're dying and our body gives up but that rest of us that energy and the love that we've put out it goes on and it it goes on i know that i i know it 
people. I've been on TV shows, did Larry King Live, and they had a skeptic who was going to, you know. Prove debunk. that you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, they debunk. The, that was the word they used, the near-death experience. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, no, you're not, because you can't prove I didn't have it. Right. You just can't prove that. And it was, you know, uh, pretty difficult. The poor guy, I felt really sorry for him. Because he couldn't. He couldn't say, well, I know for a fact you didn't have that experience. I know for a fact I did. I believe that who was talking in him was his inner roommate. Yes. <laughs> you got he, it. Oh, yeah. It's, that's also the inner roommate that says it's not possible. There could be life on other planets. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Like there's billions of planets, and we know yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know? So yeah. It, it is... Um, it, it is all it is all a mystery. It really is. And it's a beautiful mystery. I mean, I, I look out right now. I'm looking out my back window, and the sun is setting, and it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Yes. And I am so lucky to be able to see it. Right. And to know it. Now, something, if, if I can just be awake in this moment, then that's all I need, because then I'll take care of the next moment when it shows up. Isn't that true? With yeah. anything, because so often we have so much on everything that's ever happened, we've always been able to handle it. If we can just be where we are yeah. and trust in, we'll be able to handle the next thing that comes. And we do. Yeah, we do. We, we do. We handle it. And and we handle it because we have people that love us and help us handle it. Mm -hmm. We handle it because we have an inner strength that we keep working on and getting stronger. And we handle it because we have hope that it will get better. That's right. Let me ask you, in your yoga and meditation, how much of a peace, at peace, do you get? And can you compare that at all to your near-death experience? I've, I've had people that have told me, I've never discussed it on this show, but just the level of peace that can come about with meditation. I mean, it's near impossible to explain, but like it's really awesome. Is that it true? Is. Yes. And it is what I can find when I meditate is that center of calm. When I said to you, when I, when I had that ND and I moved into this space, this spaciousness, this warmth, um, I was completely calm. There wasn't even like um, an overexcitement. It was like, ah, this is where I belong. And you can get that in meditation. In that, and maybe for a few moments, maybe for five minutes, maybe only once a week, maybe only once a year, but you get it. And that awareness is like, oh, I can feel this way. I am truly this way. Inside is stillness and calmness. And I can connect to that whenever I want to if I just give myself the peace to do it. That's pretty cool. And I'm I'm of the belief because I've experienced some pretty powerful things, just like being able to do a medium reading on somebody or know something I shouldn't or tapping into something and some other weird experiences, but they only happen in that present moment when my yeah. mind is at peace. That's it. Oh, no other time. You kind of have to just put aside, well, you, the voice stops and you really are living truly from your heart. You know, your heart is open. It is complete and um, pure love. When I try to, to define what God is, it is to me love. The love we put out, the love that we have within us. Mm -hmm. That is what God is. Brilliant. Love. How about your other book, AFKI's, A Guide to Self-Awareness and Change? Well, you know, What's that all about? Barb and I had a wonderful time with that, and it happened so quickly and so easily. Mm -hmm. And it was about, you know, we have, well, what ASCII stands for is try not another, to Try not to swear. <laughs> yes, another freaking growth experience. <laughs> or you, you know, can substitute well, the four-letter word for it. Yes. A lot of words. Yep. And, you know, 
how many of those do you have when you're standing there saying, all right, this isn't, what do I have, a target on me? Right. And I, this has to happen on top of all the other things that have happened. But you grow from them. No matter what it is, you have to dig your way out of it. And when you dig your way out of it, you say, huh, I learned something here. I learned my responsibility in this situation. If you want to be honest, by the way, you can also play the blame game forever. And that will get you nowhere. But if you're just looking for the reality of things and you want to grow and become wise, then you pay attention to all those things that happen that make you feel as if um, as if there is a target on you. When you look at them and say, it's just life. Life happens. Some of it's good. Most of it can be good. Some of it isn't. And I have to deal with it. And I have to learn from it. We have to deal with the reality of everything. And we're really good at making up stories. Yes, we are. Telling ourselves stories. Mm -hmm. Telling us that that person did that to us because of such and such. When we have absolutely no basis in reality for that story. Hey, how about if we're going to make up a story anyways, we make up an empowering one. Like, (laughs) thank you, you came along to teach me compassion or forgiveness thank you <laughs> yes and you know i gotta tell you it can really change something and you know the other thing that happens is that oh barb and i find that you end up laughing you end up saying oh okay that's really pretty funny yes you know i thought that this person was this and i'm making up this big old story and in reality they weren't even thinking about me at all. Right. Most people spend their lives thinking about themselves. It's so easy to think they're thinking about yeah. us. Right. Um, there's a poem in your book called Flipping. Can I read that? You know what I'm referring sure. to? Well, because it just, I think it it was really powerful for me. First of all, after I interviewed Barb, um, like I said, a couple episodes ago, it, it, so much really hit home. And um, the AFKI's book, uh, I downloaded it on Kindle. I think it was two dollars and ninety nine cents cheap. <laughs> but it, it it only took a couple hours to read, and it, gosh, it put so much perspective on my life, my struggles, and I'm not alone in feeling guilt and feeling shame and feeling fear and and all those things. But it really just gave some great tools. And this poem, when I read it, Sharon, it was like it just spoke volumes. Now. You guys in the book or in this poem, the ego is the roommate. It's that negative voice. Right. Um, so when listeners, when you're listening, just know that that's what I'm talking about. Because we all have it. The one that looks up in our, at ourselves in the morning and we're too fat, we're too ugly, we're too oh. whatever, too many gray hairs. You know, that's, that's the ego. That's the roommate. So here it is. The, this is the poem called Flipping. The ego suffers. By resisting pain, the soul learns by metabolizing it. The ego believes it will die. The soul knows it returns to eternal reality. The ego ages in linear time. The soul becomes radiant and wise. The ego is isolated and feels alone. The soul knows it is part of something much bigger. The ego lives stressed. The soul relaxes into life. The ego is addicted to drama, to grow more of itself. The soul lives with peace of mind. The ego may know that enlightenment is not real, but it keeps trying to grasp it. The soul knows that a new enlightenment comes with each lesson of each problem that life brings us. The ego suffers. The soul celebrates. Ego and soul have one thing in common. When they are in action, they grow more of themselves. It's our choice every single time. Right. Thank you for having that in the book. Well, it, it, is, it is our choice every time. Yeah, I mean, that's really great. And I've read it over and over. And I obviously saved it because it's gorgeous oh i'm so glad that you that you not only like it but you get it 
you know? Yeah. And, and that is what we are all fighting with in our within ourselves. We let that that ego part of us have more say than the soul. One thing I really love too about this book and even talking to Barbara and yourself is it's so easy as human beings to make others wrong. Oh yes. yes. Always. And mm-hmm. what this what AFKIs did is it put me in the driver's seat. Let me work on inner peace. Let me work on why I think certain things are so. Let me work on uh, compassion towards myself and everything will work out yeah. with others, you know? And it's just, it, and so I've done years of like self-help books and transformational courses and reading and interviewing and all that kind of stuff. And everything in it, it's it's what I believe in, but it, I mean, it really is focused on me and peace within. And so I love it. And, you know, for a two-hour read, I just think it's a great, I, well, I recommend you know, it. we wanted it to be just that way. We wanted it, we almost even wanted the book to be um, in a smaller format so you could stick it in your pocket. I ordered a couple copies and they haven't come in yet, but I'm interested to well, like, know, hold it in my hand. Well, you know, really, it isn't rocket science. It is very simple, but it seems that the simpler things are, the more we resist it. We think it should be harder, and it isn't. We just need to stop resisting. We need to let go and just practice gratitude. Practice letting your inner goodness be in charge rather rather than the other way, and just say thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because my inner roommate right now is saying, there you go, trying to sell one of the guests' books again. People are going to think you're going to make a profit on it. Well, two ninety nine. how much am I going to make? You know, that's where my mind just went. But here's what I really believe is left to our own devices. We human beings, it's so easy to buy into this uh, that we forget who we really are. We're listening to the ego more than we're listening to our soul. And I think... Yeah. Whether you have a book or whether you listen to a show or whether you are reading something else, like just to have something that can restore you into this, it puts you back in the driver's seat of your life faster. You're not a victim. You can say thank you. And, and, and honest to God, I really do love the AFKI's book. And it's cheap and it's something that it's one of those things where you can open to a random page and get empowered fast so i'm going to let my roommate shut up right now and i'm not i'm not trying to make a profit on the two dollar oh, book I, I thank you very much for, because you know that's the only reason barbara and i wrote it and we just said let's just put it out there yeah i mean we believe me if you're a writer you're not you're not making money unless you're you know one of the big Names. Oh yeah, 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 you're on the whole big show or somebody like that. But you know, um, you don't make any money writing a book. You spend a lot of time and a lot of effort. And you really want to put it all out there, and that's all we want to do: put it out there. We've worked on ourselves. I have worked on myself my whole life, and I've learned some things. Yeah, I've learned some, and I just would like to share them with people so that they don't have to work so hard. Yep, and if it can make somebody's life easier, and just for our listener on We Don't Die Radio. Dot com. I have a link to Sharon Cormier's episode so you can see who she is. And also um, her books and a little bit more about her all have links, all of it right there, easy at your fingertips. So you, if you were busy taking notes and you missed a name or something, I'll have all that information there for you. So Sharon, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't that you want to share? Um No, I think I feel that oh, I, got to good. Say, I, I got to say a lot and I was... I just thoroughly loved this, and I, I I think that you are a wonderful, wonderful human being. You have, you are putting so much out there, and I thank you for the opportunity to be part of this, and that we can all just help each other. Yes, and thank you for that. And truth is, I love to learn. I love to share, and I'm a human being just like everybody listening, and I'm also looking for tools to make my life easier, you know, and... um and get that some of the crappy things really are a gift and, and yeah. to be empowered. Um, if you were to give one, oh, one idea of something somebody can do today, uh, just maybe to make it a better day, what would you tell them? I would tell them to always, every day, write down 
five things that you're grateful for. Aww. Just five, because what you'll find is that won't be enough. Um, but before you go to bed at night, just sit there, uh, lying there before you go to sleep, because it will help you sleep, and think of five things. It could be that you saw a red cardinal sitting in the tree. It could be your dog ran up to you so happy. It could be anything. And just five things, and you'll end up writing more or thinking more. You don't even have to write this down. That's because great. Gratitude is, is really the pathway to everything. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, Sharon Cormier, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you also. Thank you very much. And to all of your listeners, just thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you, too, for whoever that is. That Whether you have your headphones on or you're listening in the car or you're listening on your computer, however you're listening, thank you for listening. I know all these episodes are different. Some are filled with stories from near-death experiences. We've talked to mediums. We've talked to people by the bedside of another. We've talked to hospice nurses who've uh, witnessed some things right before people pass all episodes are different and i just hope that with every episode you you put your life into it and you really look for what can help empower you in your life today so go to we don't die radio when you have time we don't die radio.com that is when you have time and you can check out some of the other episodes and also you can um, check out sharon cormier's episode to find more out about her and her books And lastly, I just want to leave you with um, Sharon's words. I can count on it is going to change. No matter where you are, what you're struggling with, it will change. Um, Just know it will. And know that your life um, is an education for your soul. That the ego is going to try to kick in. It will. But it really is about you and your soul. Your life here on earth is very very important i'm sandra champlain and i have been your host on we don't die radio i thank you really thank you for listening and we'll see you soon